um, offset those uh, issues or vulnerabilities to climate change. So that's one thing that we're working on at a programmatic level. We're also, for a programmatic level, looking at sea level rise and more intense storms and higher fluvial flooding. So we're looking at sea level rise and um, trying to work with communities um, for anticipatory um, planning to try to anticipate like where we're going to have flooding issues and help shore up those areas with nature-based solutions. Um, and then also how much habitat are we going to continue to lose? So can we like offset that with nature-based solutions, that kind of thing, and then protecting future wetlands. So that's another thing that we're working on and how that the sea level rise and increased flooding from fluvial um, flooding is going to constrain our ability to meet our habitat coverage targets. We're also working on trying to develop engineering design criteria, or best practices for, act, for our restoration actions that integrate sea level rise and fluvial flooding. Um, and then we're looking at drought tolerant vegetation mixes to ensure functions. And now we're talking about trying to add mitigation as well as the adaptation to our program. And so we'll talk about that this, today. <clears throat> Oh, crying out loud. Come on. There we go. And then on the individual restoration project, we have our stagger wall, but a, a lot of us are starting to integrate adaptation measures into our individual restoration projects. For stagger wall, for instance, which is a roughly rough, uh, 1,000 reconnection project on the main stem, focusing on the recovery of salmon, steelhead, and lamprey, we ended up using a 500-year flood event as the engineering design standard instead of the traditionally used 100-year flood event. We're removing two miles of levee and building setback levees, and those setback levees have a living shoreline instead of the traditional riprap. And we're also restoring a historic alluvial fan to not only provide habitat complexity, but also thermal cooling through hyperaic exchange. <clears throat> so that's what we're trying on an individual restoration project. And I know like Crest and other folks are also integrating climate adaptation measures on those levels as well. So now we're getting into mitigation and how could we not only adapt to the changing ecological conditions, but how do we try to sequester carbon or reduce greenhouse gas emissions? So I'm sure you're all very familiar with um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They said over and over again, 2014, 2018, 2019 as examples, that if we want to limit global warming to less than one and a half degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, we have to make some rapid and far-reaching reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, including globalizing a carbon market. And that's a lot of what you've been talking about is this blue carbon, this idea of sequestering carbon as a way of potentially funding restoration and protection actions um, in the future. So nature-based solutions will be critical. So the IPCC has said this. Also, there's other a lot of other research that basically has pointed out that intact forests have been shown to remove about a quarter of global carbon emissions annually. And tidal wetland habitats, you know, i.e. blue carbon, may sequester as much, if not more carbon, <clears throat> and that up to about a third of emission reductions needed to meet that um, Paris Agreement by 2030 could be obtained by protecting forests, tidal wetlands, grasslands, any, basically everything that we have at this point, if we can re try to uh, protect it, we have the ability to uh, reduce about a third of emissions. And then conversely, what Lynn Cressen was talking about a little bit is that if you convert habitats, like you drain it or you create impervious service, you actually emit greenhouse gases. And we don't necessarily track those very well, what in our compensatory mitigation, um, for instance. So that's something that we would like to start thinking about at the Estuary Partnership is um, inventorying what types of habitats we have out there, what are their potential for carbon sequestration and or you know, methane emissions, that kind of stuff, and tracking how those change over time so that we understand um, the potential for sequestration, but then also any kind of conversions or loss of habitats and how that could be contributing to um, climate change. Um, so, and I know um, our speakers today, Chris, 
and Scott are going to talk a little bit about this Blue Carbon Working Group. It's a collaboration. Um, well, what I should say first is land managers and carbon finance project developers do not have local information needed to quantify blue carbon sequestration rates and greenhouse gases emissions for Pacific Northwest wetlands. So the Blue Carbon Working Group in the Pacific Northwest was formed to get at that, basically to answer those um, data gaps. It's a collaboration of scientists, um, researchers, uh, restoration practitioners, as well as financiers um, that are basically getting together to study the verified carbon sta standards, blue carbon methodology for tidal wetland and seagrass restoration, and how to develop that into a carbon market for the Pacific Northwest. And so the, their projects are designed to fill key data gaps and demonstrate the feasibility of using blue carbon to finance projects in the Pacific Northwest. And they're going to get into this database um, about carbon stocks and carbon sequestration from different types of habitats and what science has uh, shown over the last, I think, like four or five years, I think, that we've been working on this. And here's our website. <clears throat> And with that, I am done, and I'm going to turn it over to Sneha. Thanks, Catherine, for such a beautiful introduction of our uh, working group uh, today, topic today. Um, I would like to give a short introduction to the speakers before they take it away with their presentations. Uh, we're joined by two very well-known researchers in the wetland research community, Dr. Scott Bridgem and Dr. Chris Janusek. Dr. Scott Bridgem is a professor at the University of Oregon, and his research focuses on carbon and nutrient cycling in wetland ecosystems. Dr. Bridgem has also worked on climate change impacts on ecosystems, as well as functional interactions between microbial and plant community structure. These diverse research interests are united under the central theme of understanding mechanisms, controlling ecosystem structure and function. The scale of Dr. Scott's research ranges from detailed examination of biogeochemical pathways and microbial dynamics to plant community studies to whole watershed and landscape studies. Dr. Chris Janusik is an assistant professor at the Oregon State University, and he works with researchers uh, from his university as well as other institutions to study climate change impacts to West Coast estuarine wetlands carbon storage in coastal wetlands and ecosystem responses to tidal marsh restoration. His research focuses on the structure, function, and vulnerability of tidal wetland plant communities along the Pacific coast of the US. They'll be talking to us a little bit about their um, recent studies. And um, before I hand it over to Dr. Scott, I would please ask the audience to mute yourselves when you're not um, when you're not talking and please hold all your questions uh, till the discussion section. And with that, Dr. Scott, it's handing over to you. Okay, thanks. Let's see if I can figure out how to share my screen here. Um, Is that, can you see that? Yeah, perfect, absolutely. Okay, so it's my pleasure to talk uh, to this group today about land use effects and greenhouse gas emissions in the Pacific Northwest. And so I'm going to start with the professor and me with um, some background material, which hopefully will be useful to this group. Um, so blue carbon then, which you've referred to as the organic carbon stored in plant biomass and soils in marine and estuarine wetlands. And the cartoon on the right shows that that carbon is being taken up into plants and soils and stored. Um, blue carbon systems have very high serocarbon carbon densities and sequestration rates. And the graph in the bottom there shows that from the literature, where we have uh, soil uh, carbon barrel rate, and note it's a log axis on the y-axis. And so you can see those three small bars on the left are tropical forests, border forests, and temperate, temperate forests. And the three big bars on the right are estuarine ecosystems, salt marshes, mangroves, and seagrasses. And that they have about three orders of magnitude higher soil carbon sequestration rates than these 
relatively unimportant um, uh, uh, other ecosystems in the land. So we also know that blue carbon systems are widely recognized for their other ecosystem services. Um, and, but there can be offset um, the soil carbon sequestration by their high greenhouse gas emissions, particularly for methane. And I'm gonna talk now a little bit about this trade-off between soil carbon sequestration and methane and how it's viewed uh, in the, uh, climate change literature. So I'm sure you've all heard of global warming potentials, and I'm going to go back to these because this is, ends up being important for understanding this. And so the official definition of a global warming potential is the time integrated radiative forcing due to a single pulse emission of a gas relative to a pulse emission of an equal mass of CO2. So let me un unpack that a little bit. So if you have an ecosystem and it emits a kilogram of carbon dioxide, what is going to be the effect of climate relative to, for example, if that ecosystem emitted a kilogram of methane? And that is the global warming potential, but it's, it's a single pulse. Um, but it matters a lot, the time frame, because different gases have different um, average atmospheric lifetimes, and that's shown in the table here. And so you can see that carbon dioxide is complicated because it has a complicated um, biochemical reactions on Earth, but it's, it's varied. Methane is relatively short, a little more than a decade, and nitrous oxide, another important greenhouse gas that, has, um, that is emitted from natural ecosystems is relatively long. And so when you look at the global warming potential, it's going to vary by time frame because of the different um, atmospheric lifetimes of the gases. So you can see carbon dioxide would be one by definition because it's relative to carbon dioxide. But for methane, you can see at 20 years, a kilogram of methane has 87 times the radiative forcing potential than a kilogram of CO2 uptake. So that's a whole lot. At 100 years, it's 32, so it redu it's reduced a lot because methane has a relatively short lifetime relative to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And nitro nitrous oxide, it's about 260. It doesn't really matter because whether it's 20 or 100 years because it has a long lifetime in the atmosphere. So um, the time frame matters a lot. However, and most people use global warming potentials when they talk about this trade-off between gas emissions uh, with CO2 emissions and carbon sequestration. However, when we take an action with an ecosystem, for example, for example, if we restore a wetland, it doesn't just have a single pulse emission. It continues to um, emit methane and take up CO2 over time. And so what you really should be doing is the, the sustained global warming potential over the time frame of interest. And that's what's shown on this graph, where we have the global warming potential in the lighter gray and the sustained global warming potential in the uh, darker black um, for nitrous oxide in the top and methane in the bottom over 500 years. And so you can see, for nitrous oxide, over more than 100 years, it doesn't really matter which one you use because nitrous oxide has a very long lifetime in the atmosphere. And then if you go um, a lot longer than that, it makes a big difference for the, the sustained global warming potential is much higher than the global warming potential. For methane with a shorter lifetime in the atmosphere, it makes a big difference almost over any time frame that you're interested in. And the sustained global warming potential is much greater than the global warming potential when you look at this trade-off between methane emissions and carbon sequestration. And so this table shows that. Um, so here we have methane and SGWP is the sustained global warming potential versus the global warming potential in brown is in 20 years and in blue is over 100 years. 
And so you could see that the sustained global warming potential is 96 at 20 years, and the global warming potential is 87. So a little bit higher if you think about it in a more realistic sense uh, with sustained emissions and sequestration. But over 100 years, which is the default that most people use, it's a big difference as a percentage with the sustained global warming potential is 45 and the global warming potential is 32. It doesn't really matter very much for nitrous oxide over these time frames. So I think it's most people use this global warming potential. Actually, I consider it fairly scientifically indefensible because we know that it's not true that we have continuous emissions and sequestration of gases. It really matters what the metric you're using. And then lastly, as sort of background, um, I want to make the point that most wetlands eventually have a cooling effect, although it can take a long time for this to happen. And this graph shows this. Right here we have radiative forcing, and you don't have to worry about the units. The important part is a positive number means that this wetland would have a net warming effect, and a negative number means it would have a cooling effect. And shown are different ratios of the emission of methane relative to the sequestration of carbon dioxide in plants and soils. And so a value of 0.1 means that the methane emissions would be one-tenth of the CO2 carbon sequestration, and a value of two, there would be two times as much methane emissions as CO2 sequestration. And so you can see the top two lines are with this ratio of one and two. And you can see that over 4,000 years that a wetland that had this ratio would still have a warming effect. That's very high. I don't think I've ever seen that in nature. This value of 0.1, which is kind of typical for many freshwater wetlands, um, you can see it would take about 500 years. And at that point, this wetland would have a net cooling effect. And if this ratio is much less than one, which certainly in estuarine wetlands it could be, then this would be substantially earlier that it had a net warming effect. It really matters the time frame and the ratio of greenhouse gas emissions to sequestration about the net effect of any management action. Okay, so that was background. Um, there is a considerable amount of soil carbon sequestration, storage and sequestration data available in the Pacific Northwest. And Chris Janicek is gonna talk about that next in his really valuable um, uh, stocks um, website. Um, and, but there was almost no greenhouse gas emission data in estuarine wetlands. And so the Pacific Northwest Blue Carbon Working Group set out to rectify this data gap and we tried to do this at a regional scale and also to embrace the complexity of land uses of environmental drivers. We wanted to be real. So the first major project that we looked at is in Tillamook Bay in Oregon. It's called the Southern Flow Quarter Project. And uh, Chris Janicek and Laura Brophy and others were the real leaders in this. And they looked at many different responses, but um, my group focused on the greenhouse gas responses and Matthew Schultz, this was his master's thesis. And so I'm showing data from that and we still need to publish this. So it's out of his master's thesis. And so this is a relatively big restoration, about 440 acres, a complex site. So we had 12 places where we measured greenhouse gas emissions in this restoration. It was pretty soon after restoration, about one year. And we compared this to least disturbed reference sites, which in this case were high marshes. And we also compared it to three ag fields that formerly had been tidal wetland sites a long time ago. And you could see sort of the boardwalks and the chambers that we were using to do this. So um, sorry for all the data, but this only has a few main points is here we're looking at the instantaneous methane emissions relative to things that in the literature one would expect 
would control methane emissions in wetlands. And we're doing this in the three land uses in red are in disturbed sites, uh, green are in reference sites, and blue are the restored sites. And for those who aren't used to looking at the sorts of things, the R squared is the amount of variation explained with a linear um, relationship. Obviously, most of these aren't linear. So an R squared of 0 0.01 would be you're explaining a whopping 1% of the variation. And the p-value is how statistically significant it is. And 0 0.01 would mean you would expect this to happen randomly one time out of 100. And so we know that water table is important for controlling methane emissions because it's an anaerobic process. And you can see this kind of relationship. The negative numbers means that the water table is further from the surface. And you don't get much methane at all if it's more than 25 centimeters from the surface. And you get a lot if it's right around the surface and not much if it's much deeper. And you can see that really these deeper sites tended to be where there's a lot of methane. The restored wetlands because of subsidence and probably not very good tidal channel um, construction during the process of restoring it. But that doesn't necessarily give you high methane emissions. You can see the same thing for temperature, for air temperature and soil temperature. It's a microbial process. So the warmer it is, the more you might expect. And so you can get high methane emissions at high temperatures, but that's not uh, sufficient. Um, salinity is really important um, for methane, and it's really a proxy for seawater because there's a lot of sulfate in seawater, and there's another group of microbes called sulfate reducers that compete for methanogens for their substrates. And so if you have a lot of sulfate available, then the methanogens are going to win, and you're not going to have much methane production. And so you can see that here where if the salinity is less than about 5 PSU, you can get very high methane emissions, but you don't necessarily do so. And if it's more saline than that, you don't. And you could also see you can get fairly high methane emissions at circum neutral pHs and percent soil carbon didn't matter. So kind of complex nonlinear controls in this um, relatively large project. There's also just huge spatial variation. And so here we're looking at the methane emissions. And the first three bars here are the three agricultural sites. And then everything that starts with an A are different restored sites. And then the three ones to the right are the uh, reference sites. And so you could see just huge variability. So if you lop off all of the extreme outliers, this is the same data, just it only goes up to nine. And so you can see the uh, medians a little bit better. And so you could still see that when you look in these restored sites, some of them have quite high methane emissions. Some of them have quite low methane emissions. It's complex temporally and spatially in predicting this in a restored site. So how do you make sense of all of this? And one way of doing this is with a non-parametric statistical technique called classification and regression trees or CARTs. And this is simpler to understand than you might first think. And it's you just sort of bifurcate your um, data till you end up with something called leaves, sort of kind of cute. Going from left to right, we have different groups of sites with more methane emissions. And so furthest to the right are the group of sites with the highest methane emissions, and the ones to the left are the group with the lowest methane emissions. And the most important variable in doing this was water table. And if it was further than 1.5 centimeters from the surface, you had very low methane emissions no matter what. If it was closer to the surface and you had a warm air temperature above about 24 degrees Celsius, you got very high methane emissions. If it was somewhere cooler and you had a circum neutral pH and you had a low salinity, you still got high methane emissions. And in any other condition, you got low methane emissions. So you can think about this. We have a series of on off switches. The main circuit breaker is the water table. Then you have some other ones. And if you have the right temperature and pH and salinity, you can get quite high methane emissions 
under these different kinds of conditions. And so there are multiple environmental controls that are, con con that are going to control the amount of methane that's being emitted from a wetland. And this table just looks at the averages for the top is for the instantaneous and the bottom is where we try to estimate it as an annual methane emissions in the left and nitrous oxide on the right. Note that nitrous oxide is times a thousand, so to put them in the same unit, so it was very low. And so the first row here is the disturbed sites, and then the second one is restored in the bottom one is the reference. And you can see that the restored sites had about um, an order of magnitude higher typical methane emissions, both instantaneous and annually. This was statistically significantly higher. Again, it's because they had subsided and there wasn't very good uh, tidal drainage on the site. Um, nitrous oxide, there are some statistically significant differences, but the positive things, this is really low. It doesn't matter. It just was really low. So in terms of uh, climate forcing, it just wasn't important in this case, even in the farm fields. So we took that general approach. Um, that is the Pacific Northwest Blue Carbon Working Group. And we have expanded that um, in multiple estuaries across the Pacific Northwest to evaluate both greenhouse gas emissions and carbon se sequestration in naturally restored and former tidal wetlands disturbed. Um, and across multiple, multiple salinity gradients and different kinds of vegetation. And so you can see, I talked about the Tillamook site. We have four other sites that were funded through uh, NOAA or sort of associated NOAA funding that we have ongoing. Chris Janicek is involved in all of these. And it looks like we have a good chance of having another site added in the Snohomish estuary with NSF funding. So we'll end up with a very similar data set over the entire Pacific Northwest in um, many different kinds of estuaries and try to have a true sort of landscape understanding of this. And we're uh, a few years away from that. And just lastly, um, I thought you might be interested. This is also a group that's looking at methane emissions in estuarine wetlands across the entire continent US. It's through the Coastal Carbon Research Coordination Network, which is NSF funded and through the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. The photo here is the first meeting that happened at NASA Garter. I took the picture, so I'm not in it. And we're evaluating both chamber and anti-flux data throughout the US in developing a regional model of global greenhouse gas fluxes. And this is the preliminary data from that data set in undisturbed wetlands. And so again, methane annual emissions on the x-axis versus different um, salinity classes with fresh at the bottom and really saline at the top. And with the different, different distributions of methane emissions. And so you can see, and then we also have the medians in the text. And so you can see that freshwater wetlands have a huge distribution of potential methane emissions. That's somewhat true for the little haline ones. But once you get into more saline wetlands, you typically have very low methane emissions. Salinity matters a lot. This is the same data, just divided up a little bit differently. Here we have the estuarine intertidal, think basically saline, and the riverine tidal is um, fresh or illegal uh, haline. And so there's only one mat mudflat site, and it was high, but you can see these emergent estuarine saline sites were always relatively, or in most cases, relatively low. When you get to freshwater riverine tidal sites, there's a huge variation. They can be quite high. And interestingly, the forested riverine sites tend to be relatively low. I don't think there are any from the Pacific Northwest in this, although with uh, ongoing research, there will be. We do have some of these sites. And I think that they're just higher in the tidal frame and tend to be drier. So I wanted to end this with some this is sort of scientific heavy, but with some applied thoughts. 
Emissions of methane will be difficult to predict in a varied landscape because of complex spatial and temporal controls over its production, consumption, and transport. So it will be inherently difficult. However, the prior state of the site is going to matter a whole lot in the change in methane emissions post-restoration. And if you can get pre-restoration greenhouse gas um, emission data, I can't overstate how useful that is, particularly if you want carbon credits for what you're doing. Some good candidates for restoration in terms of this trade-off, in terms of carbon sequestration and methane, might be sites that pre-restoration are emitting a lot of methane. Think wet freshwater pastures that are a good example. Sites that are being restored to a saline condition, particularly if they were in a former in a wet freshwater condition. And then again, sites high in the tidal frame because then they're going to have typically the water table will be far below the surface. Um, problematic are going to be restoration sites with substantial subsidence and also those that don't have an adequate drainage network. And again, sort of removing that water off the site. At least in our research to date, nitrous oxide appears to be relatively unimportant in these systems in most cases. That's good. It simplifies things substantially. And maybe most importantly, there are a lot of reasons to restore freshwater wetlands other than greenhouse gases. And I would suggest in most cases these Trump societal importance relative to this trade-off between green, greenhouse gases and carbon sequestration. And, you know, put your bandwagon on this if it works. If it doesn't, that doesn't mean you shouldn't restore your wetlands because there's lots of other reasons that you would want to restore a wetland. And then I'm going to pass it off to Chris, and then obviously I'd be happy to answer questions later. Okay, am I not sharing anymore? Um, I think you're still sharing, Scott. Thank <laughs> okay. you so much for such an awesome presentation. Yeah. Um, am I not sharing anymore? I'm sorry, I don't use Windows Teams very often. So if you go up to that, is there an X next to the leave button? If you hit that, and then Chris needs to start sharing his. There's a big red leave. And then right next to it should be an X. Oh, I yeah. see. Okay. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> well, maybe he'll come back. <laughs> oh, no. Did we lose Scott? <laughs> <laughs> he hit the leak, not the X next to it. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> that didn't help. So you got it. Okay, there we go. Try to share my screen now. OK, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yeah. OK, perfect. Uh, well, that was a great talk by Scott. I um, really appreciate all that good information. So I'm going to talk about some related work. Um, Scott's involved in a lot of this. Um, and I'll switch gears a couple of times. I'm going to talk a little bit about the working group with which Catherine um, introduced. And then um, one of the two projects that Scott mentioned to measure greenhouse gases is um, the ecological effects of sea level rise project funded by NOAA. So I'm going to speak about that for a little while. And then I'll talk about the Pacific uh, Northwest Blue Carbon Database. So lots of co-authors have been involved in all of this work, um, particularly Scott and um, other researchers at um, Pacific Northwest National Labs, who I know work quite a bit in the Columbia uh, River estuary. So the working group was formed in about 2014. Um, there were several um, key people involved uh, that kind of got the working group started. I think I joined the working group maybe about a year after it formed. And it brings together natural scientists, social scientists, policymakers, um, coastal wetland managers with um, multiple goals. One is to advance basic blue carbon science in the Northwest. Uh, another goal is to um, share data um, amongst the different teams working on this question. 
And then finally, use those data to inform management and policy decisions. Um, the working group has a pretty informal membership and structure. We try to meet whenever possible. Most of the time we meet actually in the context of different projects that are going on, but we had a pretty large working group um, meeting virtually a couple months ago where people shared updates about various projects from uh, British Columbia all the way down to Northern California. And so far our efforts have been mostly based from about Humboldt County, California, up to Washington, but there's a lot of uh, blue, blue carbon science going on in British Columbia. So we're trying to expand and bring in those um, folks into the working group um, process as well. Um, the uh, Catherine shared the website, but you can go on the website website and see more information about our projects, uh, who's involved. And we also have a Twitter page. Um, which I run. I'm, I'm far from a Twitter expert, but um, that is active from time to time and we share photographs from the field. We share updates about different projects and results. So you're welcome to check that out. The first uh, project funded for the working group was a stocks project that lasted from about 2016 to 2019. And that had the goal of quantifying blue carbon stocks um, across the region. So Northern California to Washington and then also to begin a regional database of blue carbon information that would be um, available, um, that would synthesize all the known information and make that available to managers and policymakers. There was a second project that was uh, funded um, in, I think, 2018. It lasted just a little over a year. It was kind of a, a short-term project, but it was a short assessment of blue carbon finance feasibility in the Pacific Northwest. That focused on three estuaries from uh, Washington down to Coos Bay, Oregon. And we have two current um, projects. So Scott mentioned both of those. Those are funded by NOAA and, and the Neuroscience Collaborative. And the focus there is really to take the next step from stocks and try to understand greenhouse, greenhouse gas emission rates as well as long-term carbon sequestration rates. And there are a variety of other projects um, by many institutions in the Northwest that are working on uh, blue carbon who are affiliated with the working group. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Eastler project, as we call it, or ecological um, effects of sea level rise. So this is a program within NOAA, and it's within the NCOS branch of NOAA. NOAA has many, many arms, of course. And this is um, a program that I think has been going on for probably about eight to 10 years, and they fund different sea level rise projects throughout the United States. Most of the projects to date have been in uh, the Gulf or the Atlantic regions. There have been a few funded in Central and Southern California, but ours is the first project that has been, um, I, I shouldn't say it's the first because there were two simultaneous. So two, two projects are being funded in the Northwest. One is focused on dune ecosystems in the Northwest, and then ours is uh, focused on um, flooding impacts and blue carbon um, effects in Coos Bay and the Lower Columbia River estuary. So sea level rise is a um, persistent concern of coastal researchers throughout the world. Um, that is because even though uh, up to date, his, um, global rates of sea level rise have been relatively minor and most wetlands seem to be able to um, build their elevation at a rate equal to or greater than global rates of sea level rise, there is a lot of regional variability from place to place. And this has to do with oceanographic patterns. It has to do with um, uh, glacial isostatic rebound, all kinds of processes that make actual rates of sea level rise vary along our coast. The other concern is that um, it's likely that sea level rise will accelerate. So even though globally historic rates of sea level rise have been about two to three millimeters per year, we think under different climate change scenarios that that rate will actually accelerate in the coming decades. And so that will increasingly put coastal wetlands at risk. Um, some of the historic uh, sea level rise rates are here in the blue text. So I've listed um, a couple of different um, long-term NOAA tide gauges from San Diego up to Seattle. And you can see that there's quite a bit of variability. A place like Humboldt Bay in Northern California actually has a fairly high rate of about five millimeters per year. And then Astoria uh, actually has a negative sea level rise rate. And there are places in Alaska as well where there's actually uplift of uh, the coast. So they actually have negative sea level rise rates. And those are near-term historic, uh, usually calculated over the last 
three to eight decades. Um, so again, these rates may actually increase with with time. So the objectives of the Eastler project are really twofold. The first uh, project objective is to model how tidal wetlands are protecting coastlines from flooding under a range of different restoration and sea level rise scenarios. So we're using some of the recent uh, sea level rise projections for the Pacific Northwest uh, and the US in general. That's uh, Sweet et al's 2017 NOAA report. And we're using a range of different restoration scenarios. So we're using some baseline scenarios that are uh, what the estuary looks like today as one baseline, uh, what the estuary looked like several decades ago before several restoration projects were implemented. And then we're going to be modeling um, to future restoration scenarios where we open up more parts of the estuary uh, to tidal flooding and look at the overall estuarine response in terms of, of flooding. This work is ongoing. I don't unfortunately have any results to share with you at this time, but um, we're anticipating about a year from now we'll have results from um, this work. And this is being done by um, folks at Pacific Northwest National Labs, uh, led by Heide Diefendorfer, and they're using the FVCOM model. So two uh, uh, site-specific models, one in the Grays Bay region of the Lower Columbia River estuary, and the second encompassing the whole Coos Bay estuary, where the model will be applied. The second goal of the project, and, that, and that's more related to our conversation today, is to measure greenhouse gas emissions and carbon sequestration rates in a variety of different land cover land use types in the Pacific Northwest and along salinity gradients. So Scott talked about this a little already. So the questions we're trying to address um, in this part of the project are what are the blue carbon benefits of wetland restoration? Um, over time, do we get net um, sequestration or we, do we get net emissions? Um, and uh, and as Scott mentioned, that time frame can vary from site to site. So how long might a restoration site take before it's actually a net sink of, um, of carbon? And we're trying to also address how sequestration and greenhouse gas emissions could change with sea level rise and salinity change. Um, and then finally, a uh, final point is that uh, this particular project is closely aligned with a second project that Scott mentioned that's funded by the Neuroscience Collaborative and uh, very similar field sampling um, and design for that project, but it's based in several estuaries in Washington. These are the um, sites that we have in the Eastlor project. Uh, Scott already showed this map on the right. So the two um, blue boxes are the, the estuaries where we're conducting the Eastlor work. And as you can see in this table here, uh, you don't need to know the site codes, but um, these are our sites and they're distributed in four different um, salinity classes. So freshwater, oligohaline, mesohaline, and polyhaline, and several different um, land use types. So we have emergent marsh, that's the majority of our sites. We have several forested tidal wetlands. Um, those are um, the two of the three are in the lower Columbia and we have some disturbed wetlands and agricultural pastures and those kind of vary in their level of saturation. So we have dry pastures as well as wet pastures. Um, and then in each of these sites, we're doing a whole bunch of different kinds of blue carbon measurements. So the main focus of the project is on greenhouse gas emissions rate that uh, rates that Scott has talked about, but we're also measuring soil carbon stocks. So we're sampling soils to 50 centimeters, um, sectioning those cores every two centimeters to measure bulk density and carbon and nitrogen content. And then um, we'll also be radiometrically dating those um, slices to look at lead 210 profiles, um, look for a cesium-137 peak with the depth, and those will help us date the, um, the age of the different sections of the core and infer a long-term accretion rate. Also at our restored sites, that, that method works very well for least disturbed wetlands. It doesn't work well in restored areas or um, non-tidal areas where there may be disturbance, such as an agricultural field. Um, but there is a method that works, a different method that works pretty well in restored sites, and that's to look at an abrupt density change in the soil profile with depth. So that's a method that Judy Drexler at the USGS worked out and published um, for the Nisqually estuary. 
Um, so we're going to look for that um, uh, soil density change um, where possible. And combining the accretion rate that we get from uh, one of these methods with the um, soil carbon density values, we can estimate carbon sequestration rates historically. And uh, in addition, we're also measuring short term soil accretion rates by using feldspar marker horizons. So this is done commonly in a lot of tidal wetland projects. We established those in January of this um, this year, and we'll be probably sampling those about a year and a half after establishment. And then finally, as Scott mentioned, we're measuring greenhouse gas emissions. So we're looking at methane, carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide, doing both light and dark fluxes and about eight measurements over the course of um, a single year. And we just conducted our um, field technician just conducted the first round of measurements in April. And then I'm actually joining you from my car because <laughs> we just completed our second round of measurements um, on the Oregon coast this week. Um, in addition to measuring um, various aspects of blue carbon, so um, stocks, sequestration, and gas emissions, we're trying to look at a whole suite of different environmental drivers that may help us predict um, these uh, different blue carbon responses. So in each of our sites, we have a groundwater well where we're measuring groundwater level and salinity and temperature. We have a small sensor buried in surface soils that's measuring a time series of soil temperature. We're measuring light flux, barometric pressure, pH in the um, in the groundwater. Um, we're measuring using RTK GPS. We're measuring the elevation of all of our wetlands because elevation is very strongly correlated with inundation patterns. And this coming summer, we'll be um, looking at plant cover and composition. Um, because it varies pretty pretty dramatically across of all the sites we're involved in with the study. And this is just a kind of a schematic of what our sampling layout may look like at each blue carbon site. We have a transect of six greenhouse gas chambers. We have a groundwater well, and then um, we ha will have vegetation plots, accretion plots, several deep cores per site. And then on the right, you can see this kind of scattering of uh, red points. We're also doing elevation grids so that we can uh, generate digital elevation models of the site using RTK GPS. So finally, this project is ongoing and we, we don't have a lot of data at this point, but um, when those data come in over the next year, we hope to combine all of that information um, into um, synthesizing kind of the general question of how sea level rise and restoration could affect both flooding and blue carbon benefits of um, tidal wetlands in Coos Bay and the lower Columbia River estuary. So I'm going to switch gears um, now and talk about the blue carbon database. So the database was started in about 2018 and it was part of our stocks project that I mentioned early on, which was our first funded project of the um, blue, blue carbon working group. And that project focused on um, soil carbon data from northern Washington to California. We looked at three principal types of tidal wetlands in the northwest. We looked at seagrass, tidal marsh, we kind of broke that into low and high tidal marshes. And then we looked at forested tidal swamps. And we also collected data from several pastures that were uh, former tidal wetlands historically. We sampled from nine different estuaries from um, Padilla Bay in the north to, in Washington down to Humboldt Bay. And this figure just shows a, ver a, a very brief summary of the stocks information that we collected from these nine estuaries. So the um, total ecosystem carbon stocks in megagrams per hectare is on the y-axis and the four um, tidal, this doesn't include the pastures, but the four tidally influenced wetlands are on the x-axis from seagrass to tidal forest. Um, in brown are the below ground um, carbon stocks, so that's principally in the soils, and the above ground, so the emergent vegetation and or woody vegetation um, is in, in green. And you can see a pretty strong gradient here that um, the tidal forests really hold tremendous um, amounts of blue carbon stocks in the region, quite a bit more even than marshes which are themselves are known to hold really high carbon stocks and these values um, 
so th these data were published uh, last year in Global Change Biology, led by Boone Kaufman at OSU. And the stocks that we found in the tidal forests are really comparable to tropical forested wetlands, in other words, mangroves. And so this is kind of a cool finding that these habitats, which are actually quite rare today, most of them have been lost, um, actually hold tremendous carbon stocks. So those data from the Kaufman et al. study really became kind of the nucleus of the blue carbon database. We collected over 200 cores in that project, again in those nine estuaries, and that provided a good starting point for building the database. Um, over time, as the um, database evolved, uh, I work often in California as well and have kind of a scientific interest in wetlands across the entire region. So we gradually expanded the geographic scope of the database. So it currently includes data from um, Cabo San Lucas and Baja all the way up to Alaska. We also expanded the types of wetlands that were included in the database. So in addition to seagrass, marshes and forested tidal swamps, we have a little bit of mangrove data. We have um, tide flats, so non vegetated um, flats in estuaries. Um, we have um, some scrub shrub data, so not quite forest, but um, areas that might be um, willow dominated or dominated by uh, twinberry, for example. And then we've also included pasture data, so areas that were formerly tidal wetlands. What do the stocks look like in those in those um, sites? The main data types in the database currently are soil carbon content and density as well as soil accretion and carbon accumulation rates. We also have uh, various environmental drivers, and that does vary quite a bit from study to study because these studies were conducted in different ways with different methods. But for many of the points, we have elevation information and we have plant species composition, and we either have a salinity value or we know the location of the wetland and we can sort of guess the salinity class of, of that wetland. And then as part of the two new projects, um, we will be adding greenhouse gas emissions data to the database. So we haven't started that work yet, but over the coming year and a half, we will be adding all of the new measurements we're taking so that the database also includes methane, carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide fluxes. This is kind of a, a it's a busy schematic, but this is a little bit what the database looks like currently. It's um, at present a series of flat files and they're linked together by a common point ID. Um, in, in this case, it would be a core, but in the future, it could also be a point measurement for greenhouse gas emissions. And we have a variety of data um, related to each point ID. So we have carbon density data, bulk density. Sometimes we have nitrogen content as well. We have the position, the latitude, longitude and elevation. We have a variety of environmental data, including salinity, uh, some soil texture data, vegetation data, and then we'll be adding the greenhouse gas emissions um, and soil accretion rate data. And so the database is really, um, it's a compilation, it's a, I guess a combination of um, found data or published data um, from the literature, as well as several derived values. So we really put a lot of work into trying to standardize the way the data are presented um, across studies, both in terms of the units, but also in terms of how we're calculating things like um, estimated carbon accumulation rates. So the database work is ongoing and there are actually several different projects that are funding different pieces of the database, so it will be very active over the next year or two. <clears throat> but this is a little bit of um, uh, some summary statistics. Uh, I think this is uh, up to date as of about January of this year. So there are about 930 cores that are in the database and the, those represent about 33 different studies. Most majority of them published, but several unpublished data sets as well that people have very generously um, provided to us to include. Um, about 850 of those cores have depth specific carbon density values. Um, often those go to at least 30 to 50 centimeters depth. In a few cases, we have cores that go down to eight meters depth. So really long history of the, um, the carbon at that particular wetland. And about a quarter of the cores um, have some measure of accretion rate, 
Those are usually lead 210 or 137 cesium dating. We do have a couple of other interesting methods. For example, in the lower Columbia, we have some uh, geologic work that was done on the tsunami um, horizon. So we have, so the last tsunami was about 300 years ago. So we have carbon accumulation rates since that um, time period, for example. So we have a couple of kind of unique um, marker horizons, even some volcanic eruption data that provides a unique kind of um, layer in the stratigraphy that can be used to date um, uh, accretion and sequestration since that time point. The figure on the left shows the distribution of the data by states and provinces. So the vast majority of our data right now are from British Columbia to California. And on the right um, is the distribution of the cores by wetland type. So um, the little codes there are tide flats, seagrass, emergent marsh, scrub shrub, forested, mangrove, and pasture. So the vast majority of our data are from emergent marshes and seagrass meadows. This is a summary of the soil carbon stocks by wetland type um, across the Northeast Pacific. So same codes, flats, seagrass, emergent marsh, scrub shrub, forested, and pasture. And you can see that there's a lot of variability, kind of uh, similar to the methane story. There's a lot of variability um, in stocks. Um, and But you can see that there's also a trend that the um, emergent marshes have somewhat higher carbon stocks than tide flats and seagrass meadows. And that even higher than emergent marshes are the woody wetlands, so scrub shrub, and forested tidal wetlands. We do have, a, however, have a pretty small sample size for scrub shrub wetlands, so that's a kind of an important data gap. And uh, these figures show um, preliminary soil carbon stocks by geographic region. So basically the same data just broken out by um, uh, states and provinces um, for seagrass meadows and emergent marshes. So for seagrass, you can see that um, California, Oregon, and British Columbia have fairly similar um, carbon stocks up to a meter depth. And Washington, for some reason, Washington values are, are a little lower. Um, the sample size, again, on the seagrasses aren't huge. So um, it'll be interesting to see as we add more data if, if this um, pattern changes a little bit. Emergent marshes, interestingly enough, I kind of expected somewhat of a biogeographic gradient in carbon stocks, but they seem to be actually kind of fairly similar from Southern California up to British Columbia. Um, again, a lot of variability within um, individual regions, however. And then I think this is the final summary um, slide I have, uh, data slide I have from the database, but this shows preliminary accretion rates by wetland type and these are only the lead 210 data, so it doesn't include sort of the other methods, which can, to some extent, can be sort of like comparing apples and oranges. So this is just the lead 210 data, but we have sediment accretion rate in millimeters per year on the y-axis, and then the different wetland type types on um, on the x-axis here. And I've plotted two dashed lines which show the kind of historic sea level rise rates for both Seattle and Charleston, Oregon. So about two and one millimeter per year respectively. And you can see that for the majority of these, um, these points, so uh, the, the medians uh, for most of these wetland types tend to be at about two millimeters per year or higher. So at least um, compared to historic sea level rise rates, our um, uh, accretion rates seem to be keeping pace with um, relative sea level rise. So a couple of final comments about the database. Um, one of the uh, sort of valuable take home messages from the database has been the ability to identify important data gaps regionally. So we know, for example, that um, scrub shrub wetlands and to some extent forested tidal wetlands are really undersampled um, in the Pacific Northwest. These wetland types seem to have really high blue carbon stocks and they also seem to have fairly high um, accretion rates from what we've measured so far. So it'd be, I think it's uh, an important scientific priority to get more data from, from these wetlands and we're doing that to some extent in our, in our current projects. The database is ongoing and evolving and so if you have any data that you're aware of, published or unpublished, that you'd like to share with us, 
we'd love to incorporate that. And we're hoping to um, have two synthesis publications at a minimum that come out of the database um, that will synthesize stocks along the west coast of, of North America, as well as um, estimated sequestration rates uh, for the same region. Many of the data sets that are um, in the database, the database itself is not currently publicly available, but many of the individual data sets are available on either the Coastal Carbon Atlas of the CCRCN um, or Figshare or um, other places like the USGS Science Base. So a final couple of comments since we are, um, this is a Lower Columbia River estuary focused um, meeting today. Um, we have several data sources in the database uh, for the Lower Columbia River estuary. We have some data for marshes, swamps, and tide flats. So our um, Kaufman et al. Um, stock study uh, measured um, some sites in um, Secret River as well as Blind Slough on the Oregon side. Um, Haida and Amy uh, with PNNL have shared some unpublished cores with us. And then a number of other researchers, Aaron Peck, um, Peter Sun, and Peter Sen um, have published data. And then we have new data from the, the Eastler um, project team. Um, the final comment I would say is that given the large size of the Lower Columbia River estuary, um, it does seem like uh, much more data are needed um, on both blue carbon stocks and rates of sequestration uh, for the area. So this is my contact information. Um, you can also, um, this is also the Twitter handle of the Blue Carbon Working Group. And um, that's it. Thank you very much. Great, thanks. Now, 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 right now we're gonna ask a lot of questions for speakers. I am echoing. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Chris and Scott, for uh, talking to us a little bit about your project. Um, I think we're going to open the discussion up first with some questions to both of you. Um, should I, does the larger audience have any questions for them? Sneha, do you want to pull up our PowerPoint? Um, we have a, I, first of all, thank you again. Both presentations were just really wonderful and it's so exciting to hear about this work that's going on. And it's really in line with, um, you know, our our interest and it sounds like the interest of all, all the listeners in terms of like kind of figuring out the uh, the mystery of carbon sequestration and methane emissions and just, you know, blue carbon potential in the lower Columbia. Um, I know that sometimes it can be a slow starter for folks to ask questions to the presenters. So I just talked for a second to see if anybody is now inspired. I know Sneha and I have lots of pressing questions and probably Catherine too, but I would like to defer to the group. I did see some action in the chat. Um, does anyone have questions? Catherine, are you talking? I am not talking. Oh, uh, Laura, okay. Laura Brown has her hand raised. Oh, okay. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you. That was really, really great. And it's awesome to see all the resources out there for, um, for existing data, but also just for all the work that you all have been doing. Um, as I like think about the lower Columbia and some of the conversations around um, salinity, like, I, and I saw that you had a lot of data points kind of like coming up the Columbia. Has there been, um, has anyone looked at like not up and down the West Coast, but just moving like up the Columbia, how rates have fluxed or change or, or what would be your hypothesis on as you move up the Columbia? Um, this is Chris. I can speak, I guess, from the database perspective. Um, so most of the um, most of the I guess kind of traditional data that we've incorporated into the database has been from either the Young's Bay area. Um, you were you were actually involved in a little bit of that work, um, <laughs> some the Waluski Young's um, restoration project, um, and Aaron Peck has been uh, done some sampling there as well. 
and then from the um, on the Washington side from the Grays Bay area. But I recently became aware of um, of the uh, Peterson et al work and there have been several publications on um, uh, using rather deep um, soil core profiles up and down the Columbia and I think one of his publications extends all the way to the Portland area, interestingly enough. Um, it's been difficult. I haven't been able to, I haven't had a chance to get a hold of the author yet. Um, so I've just sort of extracted whatever data I could from the study as it was published. Um, but it does look like there is some information um, on at least accretion rates that go up to the, the Portland area. I think that the, I think that the Peterson um, data sets tend to not have carbon information though. So they've been very valuable for getting kind of these really long term accretion rate measurements, you know, since the last tsunami, for example, um, or from the eruption of Mount St. Helens, for example. But the I I think there were only three cores where I found a hint that there were carbon data available and I'm not even sure if I have the values. It may be something where I've got to contact the author to get those. And in terms of the greenhouse gas fluxes, we don't have that data yet, but we will um, in about a year or a little more. I would expect that since there's a salinity gradient there that uh, you would expect the methane emissions to follow the salinity gradient. So Scott, the greenhouse gas emissions are limited to the Young's Bay and um, Gray's Bay area, is that? That's true, uh, yes. Okay. OK. So I want to chime in because um, we are really interested in kind of expanding that up the river, Laura, as you insinuated, and kind of getting a better feel for how these things shift. Um, something that really struck me as we were going through this and something I've been thinking a lot as we've been making these plans is that, you know, we in the lower Columbia River do a lot of uh, wetland restoration work and we typically do a lot of scrape down. We think about targeting emergent wetlands as ideal conditions because it helps us combat uh, re canary grass. Um, however, I, I think that's something, you know, I've thought about a lot, you know, going out and monitoring these sites is that, you know, there are trade-offs in that in terms of thinking about carbon. And it sounds like potentially with methane emissions as well. And so I think it's something that we're really curious about, you know, when we're deciding to alter the landscape and make the wetlands lower, you know, we might be making um, some trade-offs in terms of greenhouse gas emissions as well. So that's something that I, I think is really interesting. And, you know, you really touched on that, Scott, in your presentation. Yeah, I, I think that could well be the case. And again, I tried to end on this is I personally think there are many, um, there are many goals for restoration. I, in most cases, would not suggest greenhouse gases should be the first one. Because if you think about the role, the, the ecological benefits of wetland restoration, um, at a regional and global level versus their impacts of those on greenhouse gases. They're just such small areas, they tend to be kind of minuscule to the global problem. Now, there might be a funding mechanism for wetland restoration, uh, but wetland restoration per se at a global level, it's a global problem, probably isn't very important. That might be change in the future if you did the entire globe, but. I think that's a good point. I think these wetlands are important for many reasons, whether they are, you know, net sequestering carbon or not. Um, I do think that we have, you know, it's something that would be good to know more about just so we can think about our playbook because we could be targeting these re canary grass areas for shrub scrub restoration instead of emergent marsh restoration. So it's just something, especially with sea level rise, um, you know, thinking about how that's going to impact the lower Columbia and these habitat types um, and adapting accordingly. So it's just kind of one more piece of the puzzle to consider as we prioritize. Um, but I think that's a really good point, Scott, that, you know, it's not the only piece. <laughs> so, Sarah, I, I might just. Oh, sorry. 
Yeah, I might just add that um, in our combined two studies, we actually have, I think, five sites that are dominated by reed canary grass. So we should have, uh, again, a lot more information in about a year from now in terms of how much methane those are emitting. Sneha, did you have a question? Your hand's up. Yeah, yeah. Um, so since we're thinking in terms of um, reed canary grass and restoration and methane emissions and everything, um, Scott, in your study, your um, the site that was restored was one year post restoration. Um, my question is: Is this an ongoing research that's going to monitor the methane emissions as and when the number of years post restorations increase? Or is this a one year study? And if that's the case, then why is it just for a year and whether it whether methane's emissions will vary as and when the sites become more restored or like more as more number of years pass after restoration? Sure. Um, it was a one year study. Um, it would be great to get some funding to go back and redo it after some modest number of years when the vegetation has already changed relatively substantially according to Cress, which is who's gone back and continued to do more work there. Um, so, but I would say in terms of the regional approach, our focus is on understanding what the environmental forcing factors are. I don't expect those to change in restoration. And by doing that, to be able to make reason, uh, reasonable predictions about how those will change in the future. And we do have some older restorations in other rester areas. Um, I didn't include Coos Bay because I'm, but Matt Schultz, my master's student, also did quite a bit of work there and continuing to do work there in restorations that um, are um, a couple decades old now. So we have a variety of different restorations, some of which started the different title frames and things like that. So I think, you know, the point, what we're trying to do is from the regional approach is to understand those forcing factors. And you can either do that through time at a site, or you can do it across multiple sites and use space for time substitutions. And we're mostly doing the latter. OK, OK. Yeah, um, thanks. Thanks, Scott. Um, I, I also had a question for Chris about the the database. So since you have all of these cores and different uh, methods of their collection and analysis, is there worries about like whether one method is the results of one method is comparable to the results of another method? Yeah, that's a great question, and that's something that um, <laughs> it was a real challenge in in terms of putting the database together because we, as I mentioned, we started with the the Boone Kaufman data set, which is about 200 cores, so that's about 20% of the database, and that was one particular method. And then as we we began to add other studies, um, we found that methods did vary, and so we've done a lot of work to really try to standardize. Um, the approach one, one I guess I can give you one concrete example. So some studies will measure organic carbon directly. Um, some studies will just measure total carbon, but not account for inorganic carbon, although inorganic carbon does tend to not be really. It's not particularly large in most of these wetlands. It would be in a coral reef, mang uh, a mangrove near a coral reef, for example, or a seagrass meadow near where there's a lot of carbonates. Um, but in the Northwest, it's much less of a concern. And then some studies just measure um, total organic matter by loss on ignition. So one of the things that we're doing is trying to convert in a standardized way all of the loss on ignition data into an organic carbon metric. So there have been a few equations published for that, both nationally and regionally. Um, but we have such a large data set now that I think we can actually probably publish our own regression equations based on different habitat types. So we can develop one for West Coast seagrasses, one for marshes, and one for um, forested tidal swamps. But it's been a real challenge to, to make all the, the these studies talk in a similar way. 
Yeah, yeah, I imagine because that's that's one of the main uh, problems I would assume when you're comparing like or collating a huge database from different researchers. So yeah, thanks. Thanks, Chris. Any other questions? Um, okay. Oh, if nobody else has a question, I have a question. But I want to give a chance. Oh, so I'm going to ask a question of Scott. So I started um, the meeting today talking about how it would be, you know, um, you know, the IPCC talks about like trying to protect all remaining native habitats as a way of like sequestering carbon and not emitting more greenhouse gases by the conversion or loss of habitats. Um, so question is, is that something like trying to track um, track emissions or conversion of habitats but through loss is that something that makes a lot of sense so like i think we started talking about like would it make sense to kind of inventory carbon stocks throughout the lower river and then track how any kind of conversion or loss of those habitats could contribute to, to um greenhouse gas or like climate change or is it as part of a compensatory mitigation sort of program? Is that does that make sense to you, or is that just like a pie in the sky sort of thing? That that makes loads of sense. Um, so, for example, um, it, there's been a lot of that work done in freshwater peatlands, which I work in a lot. Um, and there, the there's even though they can emit and they do emit some methane is the what we call a stop loss of carbon from drainage when you re-wet re them is a very big benefit. And so, um, and in those high carbon systems, it actually matters a lot when you re-wet them that you're stopping the oxidation of the uh, peat to carbon dioxide. That would be true also for estuarine wetlands um, in the Pacific Northwest. Is my my knowledge is there isn't a huge amount of ongoing destruction of these wetlands because there's but there's probably some, and in that case, I certainly think it should be uh, considered. For the older ones, that uh, many of them have been in pastures since 100 years or more, um, from what I've seen, they've lost most of that carbon already. We've met, we have made some attempts at trying to estimate how much carbon they've lost, and it can be a lot. Did I answer your question? Yeah, oh, I think so. Uh, yeah, no, I think so. I mean, the one the one thing is um, the protection of wetlands, the protection of habitats. One of those, um, I mean, one of the uh, rationales for it is that you already have this organic carbon content, right? You don't want to release it. You don't want to lose that, I guess, basically. So that's a rationale for us protecting these wetlands and not, um, so then like if you do decide you're going to go and build something there like a, a mall or whatever then you should have to offset that somewhere else i guess basically if, if you had a true like carbon market sort of thing i think maybe if i would say it. yes but if you're going to be sort of the carbon markets markets tend to be have very good science behind them and so that you would also need to include the change in methane emissions so it would be complicated. Yeah, okay. Um, I've made some back of the envelope things trying to do this for the world's wetlands and it's not nearly as straightforward as you would think. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine, are you satisfied? Uh, I think so. It's, I'm. I'm um, yeah, it doesn't sound like it's going to be easy. <laughs> Some things are kind of a slam dunk, like things that are in highly saline conditions, 
I think those, they don't emit most much methane. And so those are simple. Is, and in that case, making a strong argument for protecting them as carbon stores in terms of climate change is a good argument. When you get into more freshwater ones, it becomes, you have to think about the methane trade-off. Mm. Right. Yeah. That's a great segue. <laughs> <laughs> um, say, how do you want to switch slides? Yeah. So Sneha and I have been kind of um, observing at the periphery of the Blue Carbon Workgroup for a few years now, and we have been very inspired by all the good work you guys have been doing. Um, and we uh, were really excited to see more of the data that comes out of those ongoing projects. Um, and we want to, um, you know, work within that framework that you guys are creating and add to that body of knowledge so that we can start thinking more actively about these trade-offs in the lower Columbia River and these more questionable freshwater tidal systems, shrub scrub um, areas that are, you know, we're targeting to restore. Um, and so, you know, I think it's been really well established by everyone on the call that there's a lack of data in these areas and we're really interested in exploring that and you know it's not just for the blue carbon market but just understanding these wetlands that we are actively trying to restore conserve and thinking about in the future for sea level rise impacts and climate change um and so um kind of moving into this we did want to just briefly discuss some of the ideas we had and how they might complement the work that you guys are already doing and if you had some ideas we could throw them back and forth i'm going to let sneha take it away um thanks sarah so in addition to the introduction that sarah gave um we have been thinking about since we as a restoration group have a large number of tidal and fluvial sites that are either least disturbed or within a few years of restoration, and some of them are in the pre-restoration period, it would give us a good inventory of sites to monitor um, the carbon on a landscape scale, that, which means basically while moving away from the mouth of the Columbia, as well as the site scale uh, carbon and methane dynamics. That's how each of these vary depending on the habitat zones. And if we are to move forward with this, what sort of um, design considerations we should be we should we should think about and whether like how the soil structure and the composition as well as like the chemical properties would affect these rates and i would also ask the um, larger group to also share if they have any questions that they are willing to look into uh, when it comes to the carbon and methane in the sites that they're managing. So um, one of the things that Sarah and I constantly talk about is um, the potential of reed canary grass and its below ground biomass to, um, it's, it's basically the sequestration potential as well as like how that could um, change the methane emission dynamics as well because it's considered invasive in many of our uh, sites and that's like an active management uh, technique of like uh, spraying and mowing to make sure that reed grass does not come up so what are your thoughts about or if you have any studies that potentially answer this question or help in answering this question as Chris said, um, we have quite a few sites that have reed canary grass. And so, and including some on the drier end and some on the wetter end, because reed canary grass has a pretty wide tolerance of flooding. It doesn't like really deep flooding, but um, it can withstand a fair amount. So, we will have a better sense of that. It's kind of punting, but we don't really have the answer yet, but we will. And that will also include um, some estimates of soil carbon sequestration using the um, uh, the clay pads that um, Chris mentioned. 
So we don't really know yet. Um, my guess is just as a, is that relatively wet reed canary grass areas will be relatively high methane producers. And so if you're restoring from that, then if it remains wet, there might not be much of a difference in methane. If it was to a slightly drier, say, scrub shrub or forested kind of condition, it might actually decrease. If you were in a more saline area and you were going from freshwater wet flaris, uh, you know, kind of area into something that was um, more saline, you could actually have a reduction in methane that would be potentially substantial. Um, I'm intrigued about the possibility of restoration to tidal forested wetlands, largely spruce in this region, and that those tend to be at a higher tidal frame and have relatively high soil carbon sequestration and carbon densities, as Chris showed you. And you also have the substantial sequestration in wood. So the, those may be, if in a freshwater system, those might be, and we are gonna eventually have better data, but from what I've seen, those might stand out as possibilities in a freshwater situation. Hey, Sarah, you yeah, think have your hand up, Sarah. Oh, sorry, Chris, were you going to say something? Sure, just a very brief comment. Um, very much agree with what Scott said. The um, I think if you're um, looking at different potential sites to restore, then I do think that that flooding, the sort of degree of flooding, the level of the groundwater table may actually turn out to be quite important. And so I would just recommend you could collect some prelim preliminary groundwater data from your sites just to get a sense of because even if you can't see surface flooding, you can get a sense of you know how deep your water table is. And it may turn out that that's a really important driver of methane for uh, reed canary grass. That's really helpful. Um, I um, yeah, I, I feel like there's probably some really interesting nuances with the plant community interacting with the soil water interface and, you know, depending on the root system and introducing oxygen to the system to, you know, potentially influence methane emissions. And are you guys thinking about that in your work? Um, sort of. Um, we're well aware of it. Um, given the regional context of this, we can't be what I would call too mechanistic at a particular site. You know, like I have in other projects measured methane emissions out of plants. Um, it isn't that hard to do, but it's time consuming. It is so, but we are within our plots. Um, we're still going back a little bit back and forth with the exact methods, but we certainly are monitoring the uh, vegetation there, the amount of vegetation um, and uh, its seasonality somewhat. And so from that sense, um, we'll get a correlative sense of how vegetation across the many, many different chambers that we'll have. I don't know, Chris, may, it's maybe what, actually I just, it's like 200 or something. So it's a fair number. We might actually get a, some sense of it from that. Cool. Sounds like yeah, I think yeah, I think in the two combined studies, it's over probably over 200 chambers, and we definitely have a, you know, quite a bit. Having been to I think 19 of our sites in the last week and a half, and and sort of observing the plants, definitely have a wide range of vegetation. So um, very interesting. Um, data set, so we're, we're excited about it. Uh, so Laura Brown has a question. Has a question. Anybody else that's working on this, interested in this, please feel free to, to I don't, I don't, 
our group doesn't want to monopolize the conversation. So, Laura, do you have a question? Yeah, and this is kind of like a, a combo question of like just all how it all overlaps and interacts. And I know it's like plant and vegetation community, but like thinking about our restored site and like the um, subsidence and compaction of the soils, and then just thinking about how long it takes for those soils to because then can't, it's, it's not really a, a question <laughs> fully formed but basically it's like thinking about how fast sediment accretes and then like but like in terms of the decompaction of the soil desubsidence um you know ba like basically when does groundwater come back in the same form that it would at another tidal tidally influenced site and kind of thinking about like what role that plays either in carbon release or carbon storage just as the soils become less compacted which i know releases it when it was initially compacted but just trying to think about as it does, it does it stretch out or does it just kind of like get more soil on top of it does any of that make sense <laughs> that wasn't really a question was it <laughs> i got it <laughs> um I get maybe I'll take a stab at that. <laughs> so I my I guess what actually happens I I get I think you're asking what actually happens to that soil car soil profile, including the carbon and the groundwater, you know, once it's restored. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and I think I think my intuition is that you know that those soils that are from the um you know the historic wetland that have been usually compacted because of agricultural activities or dewatering and or oxidation of the um, organic carbon in the soil that those probably remain fairly unchanged although the water table you know generally we've seen like in the Tillamook project we saw that the groundwater table recovered quite quickly and that the dynamics in the restored site were quite comparable to our reference wetlands so that was about two years after restoration so we think that the groundwater recovers pretty rapidly um, the dynamics might be slightly different in a more compacted site because you get less lateral flow of groundwater. Um, but I think that, you know, once restoration occurs, that that new material that you're accreting above is going to generally be um, much less dense. So it'll have a lower bulk density, um, could have a higher carbon content, although not necessarily so. So we have some unpublished data from Bandon and and then published data from Tillamook and in both cases the carbon was the carbon content was still fairly high in the newly restored site which was interesting so then if the carbon content is the same what's going to drive your sequestration is really your accretion rate so if you're getting much higher accretion rates in your restored site because it's low in the tide frame for example and your carbon content is similar to your reference wetlands, you could actually get higher sequestration rates um, in a restored project, at least for, I would presume, for a decade or two or three until that wetland kind of reaches an elevation where it's not inundated as often and then um, accretion rates may decline at that point. That was very hand wavy. I hope that answers your question. It actually, it did. It answered a lot of the different pieces of it. Thanks, Chris. Okay. <laughs> Um, I, I would agree with what Chris said. I did, I remember reading a paper relatively recently that actually looked at long-term changes in bulk density. I think it was in Europe, but it was still a, an estuarine wetland restoration paper. And they saw that the effects on bulk density lasted for decades after restoration, as I remember. Um, but as Chris said, um, you know, post restoration, you tend to get a sort of flying silt kind of accretion. And it matters a lot at the point at which the elevation becomes high enough to become vegetated. Because a lot of times, if you have passive restoration, you might end up with a mud flat for quite a while. Um, I don't know that that's how. Uh, you guys go about doing this, but um, in other parts of Oregon, it's pretty common, it seems, and in the Pacific Northwest is, and so it takes a while to get enough, high enough in the tidal frame to get the plants, and the plants 
make a big difference in every way in terms of the soil. That's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. And like in so many situations, just kind of trying to think about like, you know, selling restoration projects to people. And as, as you were mentioning, Scott, before how, you know, don't don't necessarily sell it based on on carbon or methane greenhouse gas emission or greenhouse gas capturing. But um, but yeah, just thinking about because especially with many of these tidal reconnection processes, like as soon as you reconnect it, like fish are there, you know, the, the habitat maybe not perfect, but fish are there and they'll kind of wait around for better habitat. But just thinking about like, what's the longevity of when some of these uh, ecosystem services do return and sort of what's the, yeah, how to work that into the narrative as well when you're trying to, you know, promote a project, but that's helpful. Thank you. Hey, Laura, I want to chime in here. Sorry, Catherine. I was just going to say that um, I, you know, for my dissertation research, which is published, um, through PSU, it's like 300 pages long. Sorry, everybody. Um, I looked at uh, soil book density <laughs> and soil carbon in Young's Bay across like 21 different sites um, of, of different ages of post-restoration. And I found kind of echoing what Chris and Scott have said that recovery of bulk density and soil carbon accumulation actually varied along that uh, tidal flooding gradient within the sites. So, you know, for, for in Young's Bay, specifically for the areas I looked at, those areas in kind of the high marsh were much, much slower at recovering soil characteristics than the lower areas in the, um, in the wetland. So that was, a so that is something, it's like one of those smaller pieces of the puzzle where you can't, you know, a project within itself is going to really vary in terms of its restoration and recovery, depending on how it's composed is what I'm thinking. Um, always happy to share that with anyone who's interested. <laughs> um, I know Rudy has had his hand up for a while and I think Catherine was gonna call on him. Sorry, Rudy. Hey, that's okay. These are all great topics and they actually kind of line right up into my question. So I've been a blue carbon admirer from afar for a while. Um, you know, we had folks out from Laura Brophy's shop, including Laura Brown and and then Sarah and her in her work on our Waluski Young site. Um, early on, it seemed like a pretty exciting opportunity to bring more resources into restoration and conservation, which I think are quite important for their own sake. But I recall uh, through this conversation that the main controversy was around what is a blue carbon credit? How do you measure that? Is it renewable over time? Do you guys? Uh, Scott and Chris, in your work, feel that the field is zooming in on what a blue carbon credit is and how that's maintained? Or is that, is that too open-ended of a question or too controversial or just irrelevant for this conversation? You decide. Um, well, I'm certainly not, not a blue carbon sort of credit expert, but I've listened to many people who are. <laughs> is, and it has been looked at in some cases in the Pacific Northwest, is, and there's definitely a published protocol to go about this. So, um, and you need to know what the prior condition is. So for example, if you had oxidizing soil carbon, then you would account for that. If with re-wetting, you stop that. You would need to account to the prior methane emissions and then the post rest restoration methane emissions and then sort of soil carbon accretion and if you have significant accretion in uh, plant biomass or particularly woody biomass you would account for that so it's basically a spreadsheet accounting kind of thing of what were the forcings pre-restoration which is why it's really important to get that data because it can vary a lot. And then what are they post-restoration? And then that would give you the carbon credits. Right, and based on your work, how, how do you feel about those protocols? Is that is that in line with, with your evolving understanding? Um, do you endorse these approaches, I guess? I think there, I, now, many of the people who've been involved in in making them, not me, and I think they've give 
a lot of careful thought to them. And in most cases, I would think they're quite scientifically defensible at the sort of edge of scientific knowledge. There are some areas I think that we don't know very well. One of my favorites, because I'd like to work on it, is um, what they call a lactonous versus a toxinous carbon. So a toxinous carbon is carbon that's produced within the system, and a lactonous carbon comes from outside. And so estuarine wetlands are very open, and so you have carbon going in and carbon going out of them. And that's basically ignored in most cases. They, um, in these protocols, um, they basically exclude any alloxinous carbon. But for example, that carbon might be going out and being deposited into nearshore sediments and being stored, in which cases it should be counted. I mean, I don't know. It's a landscape watershed question. And those sorts of things, they're just the limits of the knowledge. But within the, I think within the limits of the knowledge, they're quite defensible, in my opinion. Excellent, thank you. Other questions? We have plenty of time. We, we um, scheduled this meeting to last a little bit longer than normal so that you can ask lots of questions. Um, I don't think, Rudy, to get to a little bit more of your question, though, I, kn I know um, that we've had several of these blue carbon meetings, and it's it, it doesn't sound like this is uh, an avenue for like a watershed council or somebody that's, or an entity that doesn't have a lot of researchers would be able to tap into, at least at this point, maybe at some point, um, Something like that could happen down in the future, but uh, for funding mechanisms for restoration or protection. But it does seem like you have to do a lot of um, upfront work um, that a lot of us would not have the expertise to do, I don't think, at this point. Well, Catherine, that's the heart of the problem of a voluntary carbon market to begin with. And I think that's why you see a lot of that in terrestrial systems for forestry and carbon sequestration, because there are probably more opportunities to have large scale parcels that have around age class 30 to 40 year trees. Whereas with wetland restoration, that is a lot of work. And even if you were given land and you just created a carbon market, there is still an enormous cost in maintenance and upkeep to maintain those credits. So it's really difficult to have a viable site, which is, you know, Another way of saying, if I'm going to go through that kind of labor for this, or maybe it's just icing on the cake, um, you know, I had some questions about the validity, which were answered quite well, of the blue carbon credit. It's expensive, I guess I could have said. <laughs> yeah. So this is Chris. Um, I just put a link um, in the chat. So carbon credits is sort of out of my area of expertise as well. But one of our working group projects um, that was led by um, um, Steve Crooks and a number of others really kind of looked at several case studies of whether it made financial sense to restore certain types of wetlands. And um, so anyways, uh, in, instead of, um, you know, doing injustice to their <laughs> findings, I just put a link to that report in the in the chat and encourage you to take a look at that. Yeah, thanks, Chris. And as I remember, I mean, they had basic gaps in knowledge that um, the were attempting to address now, which, and I think this becomes financially much more feasible, hopefully in say two or three years, because that's what we're really trying to do in the Pacific Northwest Blue Carbon Working Group is to provide the scientific rationale so that you don't have to do this in every site if you understand what the major regional drivers of the methane and carbon sequestration are. Uh, then you could use either models or empirical relationships to do that with, and that is certainly accepted in carbon markets if you have the knowledge to do it. 
Awesome, thank you. That would be awesome. Okay, any other questions? I know some people had to skedaddle a little bit early. Yeah, I'll just reiterate in terms of the Blue Carbon Working Group, we really hope in, hope in not too long, you know, maybe a, a couple of years, be at a point where we could really inform the larger community on sort of which sites would make sense to do this for carbon credits and to provide the data that you wouldn't have to go out and measure this in every site, which makes it completely economically infeasible. Um, and, you know, that's our goal, is to provide you as a community with that information. Um, so does it make sense? So I think, you know, we started the conversation about, um, with Sarah and Sneha talking about, um, a lack of data throughout the lower river, the lower Columbia, right? So um, about the landscape scale, like throughout the lower river, and then like at a site scale, looking up, up, uh, up bank, if you will, with the different types of habitats from like mud flats to like emergent marsh versus shrub scrub versus forested. And then um, does it make sense for us to continue working on that if, or do you feel like there's in looking at methane emissions as well as carbon stocks at these different perspectives? Does it does it make sense to continue working on that and refining the information for this area, or does it make sense for um, or is that inf information going to be important? I guess basically for what you're what you're thinking for the carbon um, database and and uh, methodology and modeling and that kind of thing. Well, I have a quick thought. Um, one, unfortunately, just because of budget constraints, one habitat type that we haven't really been able to sample either in the stocks project or the greenhouse gas emissions projects are those scrub shrub wetlands. So twinberry, willow areas. Um, so any progress that other groups could make on different aspects of blue carbon science in those wetlands will be really sorely needed the the data are so limited from those wetlands and um to the extent that those are important in the columbia river estuary i think that's an important data gap that um, other teams could help fill yeah and the other point would be that um the there always will be local factors that will be important and certainly the columbia river is a big local factor that is different than every other site. And so we're kind of focusing on two end members of that. And so I would, I think it's great that you're um, uh, getting this information and I can't see where it wouldn't be useful to uh, you in the future. Awesome, thank you. Okay, it's very helpful. Sarah, Sneha, anybody else have any questions? I was just going to chime in and say that, you know, Sneha and I, um, you know, in thinking about doing this work with uh, partners um, and Catherine, you know, we we see the shrub scrub as kind of an outlier without a lot of data. And it's actually a, a really uh, there's a lot of shrub scrub wetland plant community um, throughout the lower Columbia, especially as you move up to the more uh, fluvial dominated um, parts of the river. And so I, I do feel like we could do. Um, do some really complimentary work um, if given, uh, if, if we found the funding to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. And from Scott's presentation, uh, we've seen that the water table is so important when it comes to methane emissions. And we have the Columbia River, which has different water years and different ways of inundating these sites every year. So that's another interesting question as to how much change in our local water table or local water tables at these sites because of the freshen conditions can alter these um, these emission rates. Yeah, 
Okay. All right, cool. Thanks, everybody. So I really, really, um, Sneha, Sarah, and I would really love to um, thank Chris Oops. <laughs> for your presentations. I think it's been very, very helpful. I think a lot of people came and were very much interested in trying to integrate some of this work into their their work and um, understanding the state of knowledge and where we are with carbon sequestration and the blue carbon working group and database for the Pacific Northwest. So I think it's been really, really informative. I've learned a lot. I really appreciate it. Um, so we are, um, should have said this earlier, and I was, I spaced it, um, is that we recorded today's meeting so that we can offer this information to folks. Is that okay with you two, Scott and um, Chris, that we recorded it? Okay. The other thing is awesome. Awesome. And then the other thing is um, we usually try to post the presentations on our website, if that's okay with you. Um, if you want to send that to Sneha or myself, that would be wonderful. Um, so that we'll, we could just post the PDFs of those and then that also would link to like the Pacific Northwest, um, Blue Carbon Working Group, that kind of stuff. So people can like get information that way. Um, yeah, great. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's been fun. Yeah. Thank you so much. Really, yeah, really, thanks. really grateful. Thanks yeah. for having us. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Okay. Everybody have a good day. Thank okay. you. Take care. You too. Have Bye, fun. Everyone. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye, all. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Okay, I'm going to stop recording. Hey, you guys, that was awesome.